every now and again, you look at old photos of yourself. Doesn't time fly? You may also ask yourself, am I still the same person I was before? How can I stay myself if I'm always changing? There's a famous philosophical thought experiment that goes along with this question. The story begins in Greece. Allow me to introduce Theseus. Theseus is well known in Greek mythology and most recognized for his grand sea travels. He goes away for months. He defies heavy storms and defeats all sorts of sea monsters. Of course, his turbulent sea voyages leave that mark, and Theseus often has to go back to the shipyard for repairs. To the shipmaster! He replaces what needs to be replaced, but the ship is the same ship, as seaworthy as it was in the beginning. But not for long. As the years go by, more sections of the ship have to be replaced. Pretty soon, every piece is replaced, right down to the very last plank. The ship now consists entirely of new materials. Is it still the same ship? Now, just imagine that the shipmaster has the bright idea of taking all the old parts from the ship and putting them back together again. Does that mean that the ship will exist twice? And which one is the real one? The new one? Or the old one that's been reconstructed? Are they both real? Or neither of them? People are just the same. Over time, our bodies change like the ship of Thesis. Okay. All right. So, most of us will know that we're made up of trillions upon trillions of individual cells. And these cells don't stay the same. They constantly change. And so, and so the DNA inside the cells. Our genome is constantly changing. So the DNA that we're born with isn't actually the same DNA that we die with. And so, by the end of today, a whopping 330 billion of your cells will be replaced. So a bit like a ship of thesis, constantly, every moment, every second, every minute, cells which make up your physical existence are constantly being repaired, swapped in, swapped out. And so the question is, will you be the same person at the end of today as you were at the start? And in seven years, all the cells in your body will be completely replaced. So it begs the question, Will you be the same person in seven years' time? If yes, then what keeps you the same? If your cells are constantly being swapped out, what part of your identity is permanent? If no, at what point in, this, in that period of seven years do you change? Is it after four months? Is it after a few years? Or is it once the very last cell that was original is replaced? And so, we know that cells don't exist individually. They work together. They do things like they help us to eat, digest, to move around, to speak, to collect information like you're doing at this talk. And also if you look at the Premier League table, which isn't so great for a Liverpool fan. Next year will be here, don't worry. And uh, but as I said, it's the same with our chromosomes. Our DNA are constantly changing as well. So what really makes us us? Let's consider experience. Recently, Scientists have discovered a phenomenon called neuroplasticity, which is essentially the idea that the brain, the brain is able to change, to modify, to adapt to environmental stimuli. And so there was an interesting study, which, which uh, is an example of neuroplasticity. They found that people who had undergone training for the London taxi services, and this was back when they didn't have GPS, and so they had to remember the streets of London of head. And they found that at the beginning, they did a brain scan at the beginning of the study and a brain scan at the end of their training. And they actually found that their hippocampus volume, which is responsible for learning and memory, was actually larger by the end of the training. And we see a similar phenomenon if you learn new languages, you learn to play the piano or the violin, it's similar. This is the frontal lobe, and it's responsible for some really important functions, like thinking, planning, reasoning, and making decisions. So, for example, the science comes to this talk, uh, impairments of the frontal lobe can be serious. You can lose your ability to do maths, and you could even spoil the overall But anyway, uh, labeling theory. If we look at it from a sociological perspective, um, society really does impact us as individuals. And labeling theory, theory posits that the label that society applies to us actually shapes our identity. 
because people <coughs> then begin to interact with us based on that label applied. And so we can then start to see ourselves in terms of that label. And Howard Berkeley famously said, I am what you label me. Now we're going to get onto something which can cause quite a few headaches. I've called philosophical anthropology. And if you don't get an existential crisis by this, then I don't think I've done my job very well. Because uh, I did get a few headaches trying to find this. But essentially, it asks, what does it mean to be human? It's not just what makes me different from you as an individual, but what is homo sapiens? What makes us human? So one perspective of, of philosophical anthropology is physicalism. It's the idea that the only substance that exists is matter. And that's, that applies to humans too. We are just our bodies, nothing more, nothing less. It's the idea that everything, our thoughts, our behaviours, our feelings, our relationships, can all be explained by hormones, neurons, neurotransmitters, and brain regions. And this seems to be almost the default view of science. If you walk into a biology lesson, you're almost trying to explain the human existence purely from uh, a naturalistic point of view. Now, one problem with phys physicalism is, is presented by the knowledge argument. And it's, it's illustrated through a thought experiment that's called Mary's Room. So, to, to briefly sum it up, Mary is this clever neuroscientist who, but her whole life only knows black and white. She lives in a room, or she studies in a room, where her computer screens, her books, everything is black and white. But she's an expert in colour perception, so she knows every, every physical fact in, in physics and biology about what it means to see colour. So she knows about different wavelengths of light, she knows about the cone cells in your eyes, and how that goes through the optic nerve to your brain, all that stuff. She knows about it. But she's never actually seen colour. So one day she leaves her room and she actually sees colour for the first time. She sees the green grass, the blue sky, the, I'm not sure what she's holding there to be honest, I think it's an apple. But um, yeah, so she, in she, for the first time in her life, she actually sees colour. And so the question is asked, and that we must consider, is does she learn anything new? Now intuitively, it's almost obvious that she would. Knowing about the facts of something seems different from actually experiencing it for yourself. And so the point that Frank Johnson, who came, Jackson, sorry, who came up with an knowledge argument makes, is that physical, physicalism can't be true. Because there's some knowledge, like colour perception, like love, like relationships, like friendships, that we can't know by purely knowing the physical facts. We have to know it by experience. And so there must be something deeper than just uh, what exists physically. Then we have substance dualism, which this diagram uh, explains quite well. We have a mind, we have a body, or a soul and a body. And this was uh, famously the view of Rene Descartes, who said, I think, therefore I am. <coughs> the idea being that because he could doubt the existence of his body, and even his brain, but he couldn't doubt the fact that he was doubting or he was thinking. Then his mind, from which he was, from which the doubts arise from, must be different from his body, the object of his doubts. And so he came up with this idea of the mind being separate from the body. It can also be traced back to Plato, who believed in the pre-existence of the soul. The soul exists before our bodies do, and will continue to exist even after we die. And then there's also Freud. Uh, how many of you know about Freud? I'm so sorry that you do. He's, he's <laughs> He's an interesting guy, but some of his ideas are quite disturbing, but we'll, 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 uh, we'll talk about him a bit. So he, he came up with this idea of the mind as being divided into three parts. The ego, the superego, and the id. And then he sort of lost the plot a bit and started about talking about how we kind of secretly like our mums and want to come up that as well. So. <laughs> the thing about substance dualism, it presents a problem. It's all well and good saying that the mind and body exist separately. But how do they interact? How does our mind affect our body, and our body affect our mind? Let me go to property dualism, which is slightly different. It agrees with physicalism in the sense that everything is physical. But from this physical existence, there can also be physical properties and mental properties. So think of your brain. Your brain kind of causes feelings of happiness, sadness. And so your brain is a physical thing but it can also lead or create mental properties. Now, to go into, what, to go into religion and what the Bible says about identity, I'm happy to, I'm, I stand corrected, but it seems to suggest that, it seems to support a substance dualist view. We see in Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament that we're described as dust, our bodies are physical, they return to the earth when we die, but our spirit returns to God who gave it to us. So this idea of the spirit and also the Body. And the 
there's Matthew 10, which talks about our body, but also our soul, as if they're two separate entities. Now, for me personally, this was something that really confused me. When I started thinking, am I a substance dualist? Am I a physicalist? Am I a property dualist? I realized there was a sort of inconsistency in my thinking. When I pray, I kind of think that my spirit is in communion with God. And when I hear a good sermon, I'm like, oh, that resonated with my spirit. When I go into a biology classroom, I tend to adopt this naturalistic mindset where I think, okay, I think everything can be explained physically, you know. Emotions can be explained through neurotransmitters and cell membranes and all that. And so I think, where do I lie? And I think for now, and I'm sure that I'm going to continue probing and asking questions and challenging this view, but I think for now I am a substance dualist. And I want you to consider, what do you think you are now? And that can change over time, and I really urge you to, to, consider, to keep considering it. Um, but I do have foundations of my identity and what I believe, and I think I can build on that in terms of whether I'm a substance dualist or physicalist. But at my core, I know what the Bible teaches that I'm a child of God. John chapter 1 verse 12 says that all who accept Jesus are given the right to become children of God. And Ephesians chapter 1 supports that. Interestingly, and I, and I really like how the Bible describes this, I'm a home for God's presence. The Holy Spirit dwells in me and it describes it as my body being a temple of the Holy Spirit. And I think that kind of also reinforces my substance dualist mindset of my body being <coughs> physical, but there's also a non-physical Spirit, the Holy Spirit that lives in me. And my favourite one is to identify as a sheep, which without context is a bit weird, but uh, I'll explain. There's this really nice theme that goes throughout the Bible, and it kind of starts in Psalms where it talks about, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He leads me beside quiet waters, he makes me lie down on green pastures. And it carry, carries on into John where Jesus actually says, I am the good shepherd, almost as if I am what the psalmist was talking about here. And he says, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. And it reflects this kind of personal relationship between yourself and Jesus, the good shepherd. And then there's also 1 Peter, which reinforces this thing that says, you're like sheep going astray. In other words, and I can relate to this, constantly turning away and doing what I think is right, what I think is best for me, but always returning and being found by the good shepherd, the overseer of your souls. So this is my favorite way of identifying myself as a sheep. So going back to the puzzle of identity. I quite like the metaphor of identity being uh, a puzzle. But it's an unusual one and a unique one at that. The pieces are, seem to be moving. They seem to be constantly being replaced. And we're not even sure we have all the pieces. There could still be some hidden away in the puzzle box, so to speak. And perhaps the most important question of all is, who's piecing this puzzle together? Is it us? Do we have control? Is it chance? Is it fate? Is a society? I believe there's a master puzzle, and he calls himself the Good Shepherd. And he wants, us, he wants to work through us to piece together this, this puzzle that makes up our identity, to form a complete and eternal picture. And when he's finished, he'll take a step back, he'll look at it, he'll smile, and he'll say what he said in Genesis and say, this is good. Thank you. Uh, the Tui Talks was a great experience. It allowed me to explore topics of interest in greater depth. I felt the Q&A session at the end was a great experience as well and it allowed me to uh, think more about the topic that I'd researched and that I had spoke about. And I thought it was great for the audience to have a chance to clarify and ask further questions about the talk that I gave.